So hi, Maria. Thank you for doing this with me. Um, it's really exciting getting to actually talk to you. I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> we've talked so much <laughs> over email that like talking yeah. face to face is, is different um, and kind of fun. Um, so yeah, I guess let's talk about goosebumps to start with. Why not? Sounds good. That's, that's why we know each other. Um, that's what we work on together. So I guess what, like, what was your growing up experience with Goosebumps? Obviously, like, it's like a worldwide phenomenon, right? Like, yeah, like American kids aren't the only ones who grew up with these books. So no, no, I, yeah. I read them in translation. Um, I read the Dutch, Dutch versions. Um, definitely watched the TV series too. Um, at least parts of it. I yeah. mostly remember just being terrified by it. Mm -hmm. Like, weirdly, I, I love writing spooky stories and thrillers and all of that. But when it comes to reading or watching, I prefer to do so by daylight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I scare quite easily. Um, so yeah, it, it was this, this kind of, I'd almost say love-hate affair between really enjoying the books, but also just being being appropriately scared yeah yeah I think, <laughs> I think goosebumps is so interesting because they're so legitimately scary like I feel like like kids scary stuff isn't always actually scary in a way that like goosebumps is or that, that's what makes it what made it so scary as a kid too yeah. it, it it made it feel far more real than if if it had all like wrapped up with these happily ever afters so I, that's that's definitely one of the things that just sticks with me most the experience of reading a book and then finishing it and just feeling slightly uneasy and um, uncomfortable <laughs> and realizing like yeah that's that is the proper goosebumps experience <laughs> yeah what was your what was like your favorite goosebumps story when you were reading them as a kid um Definitely the the werewolf stories. Like there's a reason why I wrote werewolves too. Um, yeah, those were I I love monsters. Um, I I love like legends and myths and lore and werewolves just fit squarely in that. Like th that it scratches that itch. Um, whereas like slappy stories and and scary doll stories, nope. Yeah. Hate them. <laughs> Can so you're not a fan of like the Annabelle movies? Those aren't. No, those aren't absolutely good. not. <laughs> I get it. Creepy dolls are like next level. Oh, no. when you're taking. Yeah, I appreciate them from a distance, but yeah. <laughs> ideally, like in other people's houses. And again, daytime. What kind of and the take on werewolves in Secrets of the Swamp is a little different than I think most werewolf stories. What made you think of kind of going that direction with the werewolf lore in this case? I think one of the things that, one of the reasons why werewolves and, and, and also like in, in broader terms like vampires and stuff like that like, like really appeal to me is that there's this, this essential human size to, to this particular type of monster lore and um, I, I heard a friend of mine describe werewolves as basically just very misunderstood uh, creatures, mm -hmm. which I get that. I like, I like that idea. So I like the idea of just exploring not just the monstrous side, but also the human side um, and, and the ways in which monsters can be human, but human can be monsters. So I think that's, that's just one of the things that appeals to me. It's also one of the reasons why those stories at large appeal to me, because generally speaking, they're very much meant to be um, ways to understand the human condition, um, what it means to be human, um, and then all the shapes and forms that can take. So it seemed like fun to to sort of play with that in in this particular context and write about the human condition for children. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you know the werewolves are so surprisingly. Um, without giving too much away. They're yeah. so surprisingly uh, easy to, to empathize with in this story. Um, so what is Blake like as the main character of the story? Not a werewolf herself. Nope. Blake is a, is a gamer. Yeah, but... um, 
Blake is very much a like gamer girl, bit of a tomboy occasionally. Don't know, definitely not always, but she's in for um, she's in for adventure. She's in for proving herself in game and out. Um, she very easily ri rises to challenges. Like in in that sense, Blake is probably like that's probably the part where I connect most with Blake that sense of tell me I can't do something and I'll prove to you I can. Um, that's that's very much Blake's Blake's MO too. So um, yeah, she is she loves gaming, she loves playing Lore Hunt, which is a game she shares with her friends and basically wants to be the best at that. And and then when she meets Lily uh, early on in the in the first issue, um, Lily makes a comment about like Blake just not being because Blake has a prosthetic hand, so she basically makes a comment about that, and Blake is like, "Well, I'll show you that I'm actually the best at this." And I think that really sums up Blake. Like, give her a challenge, and and she'll rise to that, if only out of like a sense of spite and and <laughs> wanting to prove herself and wanting to convince the people around her that she is completely valid and probably a little bit better than all of them. She totally is, honestly. Yeah, like, watching her, like, run through the swamp and and do all of this kind of crazy stuff without seeming to miss a beat is so cool. Like, I think at, I don't know, that age, I probably would have been hiding in yeah. my bedroom instead. And I mean, <laughs> honestly, honestly, same. Like, I definitely, we at that age, I definitely had, like, adventures in, in the woodlands here, but never like that late at night and and never in in the knowledge that there might be mon monsters there so um yeah no blake is like she has this conversation with eden her friend at some point and and eden says something along the lines of well you could have just said no and that just never registers to blake like what yeah. do you like no when people <laughs> ask something of me and and challenge me to do something there's no possible reason to say no so yeah. yeah, that's that's very much her. So do you think there's like something, what is it that a tr that makes her feel, I don't know, a certain way about the werewolves that's different than Lily? I think she is, for all that, that she'll immediately jump to something when challenged. Um, she doesn't necessarily jump to conclusions as much. Mm -hmm. um, she's more of a wait and see and figure out what's going on um, before she actually like makes any judgments about the situation and and in part two like her wanting to prove herself but is definitely the flip side of the coin is is people underestimating her or even bullying her because because she has a prosthetic hand because she's different than like what people would expect so that's that side of her is, is she's constantly aware of people judge me based on what they see so i don't want to do that to others which is also why um once she learns a bit a little bit more about the wolves um she she's interested in and in, in intrigued and curious more than necessarily immediately judgmental how do the werewolves like they live in a swamp which is an unusual place for werewolves to live <laughs> how does how does a group of werewolves end up living in a swamp in the first place, would you say? Um, I mean, for me, it was mostly just um, they are there because fever swamp, which is where the werewolves right. are. <laughs> um, but I think to, to, to like rationalize it a little bit for myself, it, it's also this, this fairly um, like inhabitable place, but it's not easily accessible and and that makes it a really good hideout mm -hmm. it's, it's a place where they can um because i i basically just assumed like if if you're going to think about a world where werewolves exist then by definition there has to be something in like in the way of behavioral understanding even like werewolf culture maybe like there's this this strong human sites werewolves so that must mean that they have found ways to figure out their own pack their own 
way of life um, and and they can probably not do so anywhere close to normal people because yeah. again werewolves so <laughs> <laughs> they needed they needed a good a good hideout a good place to um, come together um, to t- take care of each other, to maybe meet up every now and then and, you know, share stories about werewolves on the other side of the country or like the latest in, in you know, lupine fashion. I don't know. Um, <laughs> surely there's something like that. So that was basically my idea. Like there has to be something that makes them more than just monsters. So what is it and how to, how should we, um, create that in terms of the story, in terms of world building, and that's that's how their hideout in the swamp came to be because they needed a place to just be themselves. I love that idea of like, you know, usually when you see werewolves in in stories, they're loners, and yeah. I love the idea of like a werewolf community, right? As well. And it's it's interesting because I think a lot of communities that are I don't know more focused like like minority communities particularly Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people tend to feel kind of alone and seek spaces like that yeah where they can be themselves and and share their experiences and I think yeah it's really cool that that these werewolves have a similar space I I think that works really well as a metaphor as well yeah, I mean, I th- there's definitely certainly a hint of that too. Like, on on one hand, it's just like that's how wolves behave. So <laughs> you don't see lone wolves generally speaking. So clearly, there must be some element of that too. But there's also this sense of like, it is in an ostracized community, and obviously, like you can go into detail on how, uh, like, monsters as metaphors for minority groups is very tricky. Um, so I definitely didn't want to lean in too hard to that, but I did want to sort of explore what, what like being, um, being a monster meant in this, considering like, just assuming that the world of Goosebumps is where all of this is somewhat normal. So it has, it has its creepy aspects, but it also has to have its more normalized aspects. Yeah. And, you know, there's such a question here, too, of, like, who is really the monster in the story? Yes, yes absolutely. I think all of that subversion really is super fun. And I've expected, I think, even for, like, a Goosebumps book, which are wild and weird sometimes, yeah. but often follow a pretty standard, like, horror format, I guess. Yeah, but, that that was one of the reasons why it was so fun to play with that, too, just because I knew it was... it sort of played with expectations a little bit and and i think that that's that's the key to horror is figuring out like who is the real monster here and yeah. it, it, it's usually not who you would ex- expect so yeah. uh you mostly write prose by trade um with with some forays into to comics here and there what mm-hmm. how has it been different working on a like a serialized story like like this one and how, how how has your process been affected by that, that in the storytelling? Um, I it, it in in terms of like actual process, it hasn't been that different. Um, I my my writing is tends to be very structured, so I love working based on on outlines and having a, a sense like an understanding of what needs to happen when and 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 at which deadline. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so slightly important detail um so in in that sense this this slotted into like my general process quite easily it it felt more like sharing parts of the stories with like um at at regular intervals as opposed to just right like writing all of it in one go and obviously you have to think about um how the, the the single issues work as well as how the entire story works which i th- i thought was a really cool like, thought experiment and experience to just play with that and see how i could make the single issues stand on their own as much as possible while also being aware that at some point a lot of kids are going to read it as like a singular story so it has to work 
in both in both situations um but yeah i i actually really enjoyed just having this this like periodical writing projects where for me it was, for me too it, it just felt like this this story i worked on from month to month um around and in between doing other things and it was it was fun to go back to fever swamp every time so it was really really enjoyed doing it in that way yeah that's interesting i didn't really think about the periodical kind of nature of the storytelling it does mean that you don't have to write it all at once did it had um did getting to sit with it like that like change anything in the story for you or give you like new new feelings about the characters or the direction you wanted to go like on occasion there were definitely moments where um and 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 that was that was definitely a a, a learning process for me too but there were moments where i was writing um working on a, a later issue and thinking well if i'd known this would happen in specific detail i maybe would have gone like gone back and see the things in in earlier issues a bit differently um so i i mostly try to fo focus on like the flip side of that like since i didn't know that and this is what i did in the earlier issues how can i use that to sort of strengthen that or make it seem like i actually knew what i was doing and see that early on um so that was that was a fun like almost game for myself to like you so it suddenly has to deal you suddenly have to deal with the fact that you can't go back and edit stuff mm. whereas that is the main thing with like working on a a regular book um, is that all of it happens in one go and if by the, the final chapter you realize that you wanted to do something different by in like that one singular detail in chapter one you can go back and change that and here it was like well no chapter one is set in stone so mm -hmm. take all those details and find other ways to play with them um, but I yeah I really enjoyed that and I feel like we settled on the outline quite early on so I knew what every issue needed to be and I knew how to get to that point so details may have changed a bit and like insights in the, into the characters definitely especially as Yasmin came with her amazing artwork like yeah. that definitely for me to help get a good sense of who the characters were and and even just facial expressions do so much um so that that absolutely informed later later issues but uh nothing really substantial changed it was more like finding the right details and maybe polishing bits and yeah. bits and pieces here and there but that's that's about it yeah and yasmin's so good at making the characters readable i i was so yeah. every time we got a new page i was like i don't even need to know what she's saying here i know nope. exactly how she feels and she's annoyed or she's excited or yeah. whatever and her postures are so good and everything it she's really yeah she's she's got that like middle school eye roll down to a t it's amazing yeah. i love it so much but yeah it, it's also just so much fun seeing all the art come in and i feel like every time new pages come in like all of us just sit there and go like yep this is perfect this is this is gorgeous how do yeah. we even do it yeah it's like become a great team between you yeah. and Yasmin and, and Rebecca. It's just yeah. been like a, a really solid good time there. It's it's honestly one of my favorite things about writing comics and, and graphic novels and just having that teamwork is it, it makes it it makes it so special. And I'm I'm not a very artistic person at all. So for <laughs> me like art is always a kind of magic. So seeing the inks come in and seeing the colors come in, it just like it, it brings the story to life for me too and that is that is such a cool experience what is your favorite part so far of the series that you've seen drawn and what and as a follow-up question what's your favorite <laughs> what what are you most looking forward to seeing next without too much without <laughs> <laughs> um my favorite part so far is seeing the burrow which mm. I absolutely loved, which um, readers will get to at some point in issue three. Uh, <laughs> so they have a little, little while left to wait. Um, but that was like that, that center page was 
just so cool and it really felt like everything was coming together there which um yeah love that um the one i'm most looking forward to is actually the last page because yeah. i know what's going to happen <laughs> i'm very excited for that that was yeah. my that was my big like like reading the end of the last script was was the big goosebumps moment for me yeah. where i remembered like being a kid reading these books and getting to that last page and being like oh my god yeah That's so it. i am super excited to see that <laughs> it's gonna be amazing i think we're just about out of time but thank you so much for for doing this with me it was really fun yeah this is so fun, fun. it's so nice to like actually talk well not in person but at least see you and get yeah. to talk about scary things thank yeah. you thank you Thanks. have a great day